Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. I am delighted and honored to have uh, Dr. Brian McVeigh back doing his series on Japan. And today we're gonna to be talking about visuality. So Brian, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Sure, Kant, and thank you everybody for coming uh, today. So visuality, uh, the, I think I mentioned uh, two or three weeks ago, for those of you who attended uh, uh, the podcast, that uh, back in the mid 90s, when I was in Japan, I wrote an article about visuality in Japan. And what struck me was how everything seemed to come through uh, the, uh, I was going to say the lens of visuality, but let me put it this way. It seemed that everything, so many things in Japan were expressed using, for lack of a better term, visuality. And I was really impressed with this. So I wrote an article. It uh, was re rejected, which is quite common in academics, actually. Very few articles are ever accepted, at least in their, their first incarnation. But in any case, I sort of gave up on the project, and I never got it published. Uh, one of the criticisms was that, well, there's nothing special about Japan because you can find examples of visuality in all cultures. And of course, that's true. That was not the point I was trying to make in this article. Uh, but in any case, so what I want to do today is share not the entire article because it's a, a little bit, uh, I think, a little bit complicated, but I, I at least want to highlight some key points that I try to make in this article. And one thing to be thinking about as I'm giving examples, and that's how I'm going to start, I'm going to give several examples, uh, very obvious examples of visuality um, in Japan, is to think about the linkages between visuality, capitalism, marketing, consumer's desire. So these things are all the same ball of wax, as it were. They're all very much interrelated. And I think a good researcher, when he or she studies another culture, really has to take in not just the phenomenon that they're examining, but they have to take in the larger political economic context. And of course, in the case of Japan, that's capitalism and that's consumerism and also desire. And hopefully the linkages will become more clear uh, the more I talk. And then towards the end, what I'm going to do is just throw out a few philosophical perspectives on how to tie everything together. Uh, what, what does this have to do um, with issues, for example, mind-body dualism. That sounds a little bit abstract at this point, but I just want to mention it. And I, the, the reason why is because my talk today is not just about what happens in Japan. There, are, It's about, in general, how the human mind attempts to process information, uh, among other things. So to get the ball rolling, let me give um, a, a few examples. The first example I'd like to begin with are what are called uh, visual menus in Japan, or what are called food samples. In Japanese, that's shokuhin sampuru. So of course, sampuru comes from the English word sample. Shokuhin just means food. Food samples. Uh, so uh, when I, I'm, and I'm sure some of you have been to Japan and you're familiar with this, but in any case, when I first went to Japan, this is one of these things that stood out, how almost in front of every coffee shop, humble restaurant, uh, mid-range restaurant in terms of uh, price, and even high-class fancy restaurants. Almost always they would have these um, displays, in, usually in their windows, of food that looked very, very realistic. And basically, to my mind, it's an art form, a, a very developed art form. Uh, I don't want to say it's uniquely Japanese, but it seems to be pretty common uh, in Japan. And um, uh, Shurkant, I'm not sure if you're there. I know that you're... Um, uh, yes, I'm very much here. So I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So if you take a look at your screen, uh, these are just typical examples of um, what are called uh, food samples or food models in Japan. So 
if I had to give a title for, for this section of the talk, it would be the I, the, the eyes know what the stomach wants. The eyes know what the stomach wants. And so just hold that thought because later on, we'll talk about that <clears throat> later on. What are the philosophical implications of making the claim that the eyes can know something? We don't usually talk that way, um, but I think, it's a, I think it's a good way to begin uh, thinking about some of the issues that we'll deal with later. So let me just give a, a little bit of historical context on uh, food samples in Japan. The origin seemed to have been in the late 19th century, uh, uh, but really it wasn't until after World War II in the early 50s that sculpting these food samples really developed and evolved into the art form that it is today. And originally these uh, pieces of art were made out of uh, wax, but wax would melt and so they started to use a more lifelike vinyl uh, plastic. And actually, uh, I think originally in the late 19th century, they used to use actual food. Uh, you know, they would take a, 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 a sample plate of real food and put it out in front of uh, the restaurants. And when I was in Japan, from now and then I would see that. But of course, most restaurants uh, would uh, put in an order with an artist to develop these uh, these food samples. These very, very, as you can see, very lifelike uh, uh, e examples. So that's that's one example. And uh, it's it's so when I was in Japan, just walking around any urban area, wherever it was, it was so much for me. It's very enjoyable, and I had a whole collection uh, of photographs that I took of these uh, food samples. But of course. Uh, now, you know, we can get things so easily uh, online that it, it, it's not the, you know, the, 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 all these photos I took, I don't have, I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> but so that's the first example of visuality in Japan. So there's another example uh, that struck me when I first went to Japan. And again, this is not necessarily unique to Japan. So, so a good anthropologist, I think, always understands that when you see some phenomenon in one culture, always assume you're gonna be able to find that same phenomenon somewhere else in another culture. There's no such thing as a truly unique phenomenon in some culture. It's just a matter of emphasis and stress and how much people in a given society talk about something or make a big deal about something. But so I, I want to mention that now because I know some people might be thinking, oh, well, we do the same thing here or I've seen that phenomenon uh, somewhere else. But it's a matter of degree. It, it's a matter of emphasis. So the next example concerns uh, how when you when I would watch TV in Japan, when I, especially when I would watch journalists or uh, newscasters, they would always have to have visual aids, visual props, a list, a diagram, sometime some sort of a, a picture of something and they would peel off uh, a sticker to reveal underlying information. So, so the, the idea here is that you just cannot explain something to somebody verbally and expect them to receive it uh, auditorily. The idea, it has to, information has to be conveyed through the eyes uh, uh, visually. Um, and again, we see that when, when we watch, uh, when you watch news, of course, in, in the United States, uh, they rely a lot on visual aids, but it just seems to me in the case of Japan, there's a lot more emphasis on it. Also related to this, when it would come to advertising on TV, not just in, on, on TV, but uh, just walking around the streets, people would dress up as animals or they would dress up as some sort of everyday object in order to advertise something. And the, the, of course, anthropologists call this anthropomorphizing uh, uh, an animal or some sort of inanimate object. And supposedly people who have commented about on this in Japan point to Japan's ancient animist roots. 
right? And th this idea of animism, that everything is alive. But in Japan, this has been updated into an advertising format where things and people and, and, and animals are used to uh, sell things or just, just for entertainment uh, purposes. So I would see uh, toothbrushes, uh, kitchen appliances, computers, lamps, whatever it is, um, the, these things would be anthropomorphized. And, and it, that doesn't relate directly to visuality, I suppose, but still there's this idea, if you want to catch someone's attention, you do it not just through text, not just through telling them, but through actually representing the thing in visual form. So uh, there's another example. Uh, again, I think we're familiar with this uh, in Japan that has a lot to do with visuality and uh, a way to just convey information. And that is uh, manga. Uh, and usually in English, uh, that's translated as comic books, but that's not really a good translation for different reasons. Uh, manga are very, at least when I was there, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what's going on in, in Japan more recently, but when I was there, everybody read manga, no matter where you would go. Uh, for example, if you're commuting on the train, you would see young people, middle-aged people, even older people, male, female, consuming manga. And some of these manga could be as thick as uh, 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 a comic book. Um, the, the, uh, what's important to point out is that many Japan observers view manga, just like food samples, as its own art form. And, and I think that's a good characterization. I mean, traditionally, when people would think of Japanese art years ago, they would not think of manga, right? Because it's sort of the manga were looked down upon. Manga uh, were sort of a, an everyday aesthetic that should not be taken too seriously. I don't think that's fair. I mean, I used to teach a course on Japanese pop culture and I was always struck at how profound and sophisticated pop culture, at least in uh, Japan could be. So in any case, uh, manga, the, the, what, are the, what are the topics? I mean, any topic, fiction or nonfiction would be covered uh, in manga. So it could be about uh, children's stories, sports, fantasy, science fiction, uh, any, something pornographic, of course, would often be put into manga form. And this, this mass consumption of manga, uh, some people have explained that as being related to what, well, I, one time I, I heard in Japan um, this term, the visual generation the visual generation, uh, shikaku seidai in Japanese. And the idea here is that younger people, especially beginning in the 1950s, have been brought up on TV and then more recently uh, video games, um, screen mediated information, something that we take in with the eyes. And so therefore we have cultivated this uh, visual generation. I don't think this is anything unique to Japan, of course, but uh, but I'm just uh, mentioning that to show how uh, powerful visuality is in Japan. So to get back to uh, manga, uh, just some quick historical background. The word itself supposedly was coined in 1814. So the word has been around for a while. It was coined by the very famous artist uh, Hakusai. And manga comes from uh, two words. So man, which used to mean something like morally corrupt, something involuntary, something that you do in spite of yourself, something you have no control of. So there's something illicit sounding, I suppose, with that, the first ideogram, man. And then ga, which in Japanese just means uh, picture. So I don't think morally corrupt uh, pictures is a good translation of what manga means 
in contemporary Japan. But in any case, uh, just to give some historical context, the idea here is that it's for pure entertainment. Manga should be for pure entertainment, I suppose. Uh, there are other important precursors historically to manga, especially you, you, you can, we can go all the way back to the 12th century. And there was an artist called uh, Toba Sojo. And he used to paint or draw caricatures uh, of animals, perhaps performing human tasks. So there was sort of a lighthearted uh, uh, touch to, I think, a lot of his work. However, I, I think it, I think th there was some satire there too, uh, making fun of uh, people, the, the, the political and the religious elite using these characters. And so they had this word, in fact, called Toba e. So Toba, the name of the person, and then e is just another word in Japanese that means um, picture or perhaps painting. Uh, there are other, so some other important precursors to manga, just to give you a sense of how it e evolved in Japanese history. Giga e, which means comic prints, and then asobi e. Uh, asobi means play. And uh, so playful pictures. So you know, we're talking maybe from uh, the Japanese Middle Ages, but uh, up to the Tokugawa period, which started in the early 1600s. Also other precursors, uh, Kyoga, which means crazy pictures or mad images. And then by the time we get to the 19th century, other artistic traditions that fed into what would become manga came from the Western world. So for example, something called ponchi e, and uh, ponchi comes from uh, uh, the British, what was uh, created in uh, Great Britain at that time, um, punch pictures, famous cartoons. And then by the time, especially after World War II, uh, you had a lot more European American influences that fed into what we call uh, manga. And just um, a couple more uh, points about the role of manga in Japan. When I was there, people, I used to hear this word, uh, mangafication, the mangafication of knowledge. And sometimes this would be used as a criticism, but other times it would be used by certain scholars to describe how manga were being used not just for entertainment purposes but also for pragmatic practical purposes so manga would be written on any any topic that had some sort of ed educational value so in fact that's a term educational manga uh, that they would use so for example politics the ecology uh aids how to deal with local government uh, family issues sexual techniques, anything you could think of would be put into manga form. The closest thing in the United States, we have those books, um, Computers for Dummies or something like that. But uh, and there's, actually there's two or three other um, uh, uh, types of those books. So that's the one that comes to mind. Uh, but if you look at these books, they're, they don't really rely on um, manga excuse me, they don't, they don't rely on visuality the same way that manga do. And so I think they're a, a bit different in that regard, manga are quite different, these educational manga. So the idea here in Japan is th there's a belief that you can transmit information more effectively by not using text or not using script, but rather to use visuality. Again, that's not unique to Japan, but it's a matter of emphasis. I, I think you'll find more examples of it um, probably in Japan. Uh, and also another interesting thing about manga, if you look at present day manga, the, the pictures are designed uh, almost as if they're movies. In fact, someone described manga as being like cinema, uh, cinematically formatted created like a movie. So of course, like comic books that we're familiar with, manga have different frames, but they also use um, techniques that a movie maker might use. So for example, close-ups, visual uh, uh, close-ups of someone's face, uh, 
looking at something from a distance, using different angles. So I think that's another way to think of uh, manga, that basically these are movies somehow put into uh, book form. And to get back to this idea of th th this attempt in the case of manga to convey information visually rather than in text, I, I don't want to talk about this too much because I'm not a neurologist, but I think it does have something to do with right brain, left brain. And we have to be very careful because some people make the claim that Japanese, this, this claim has been made, I, I don't think it's true, that Japanese are more right brain and Westerners are left brain. It, it's far, far complicated than that. I think it comes down to the individual and how an individual is trained. But in any case, the idea with manga is that uh, there is something more right brain going on because the idea is that uh, the right brain relies more on images than uh, the, the left brain does, whereas the left brain, of course, relies more on linear uh, text. So those are just some examples of visuality. There are many other examples I, I could give uh, from Japan. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about, uh, this, this is maybe a little more academic, but this idea of how in Japan, not just in Japan, but in many places, how visuality rationalizes and disciplines what we see, okay? So that, that's, I think, a little bit vague and abstract. So what do I mean by that? Well, the idea is it, if what, what an individual is taught to see certain things depending on the period and depending on the place, and I think th this is where capitalism comes in and consumer's desire comes into the discussion. So the idea, if you look at a lot of visuality in Japan, basically it's teaching people how to be good consumers, how to, a lot of visuality in Japan is trying to cultivate uh, desires within the individual. And again, that, that's not unique to Japan. But I think in the case of Japan, they do a very good job of teaching people to be uh, good consumers. So the idea here is people are primed by their environment to be receptive to certain forms of visual knowledge. So what I'm going to do now is uh, become even a little more abstract and uh, talk about the, the sort of philosophical uh, po po possible philosophical implications uh, about this idea of uh, uh, that, that, that our eyes think. What does that mean, our eyes think? Usually we don't say that in English, right? We say that my mind thinks or my brain thinks. And we have this dualism, right? That our senses, our perceptions are oriented toward the environment, whereas our mind is something more intellectual, somehow more uh, psychological, and, and that there's a, a, a clear divide between what our perception of things does and what our conception of things uh, do. But, what I'm trying to say is that actually, if you want to understand human psychology, we have to avoid making these dualisms because the, the eye and not just the eye, but other senses are really so much a part of the mind that we have to transcend uh, mind-body uh, dualism. And the idea is to unite the perceiver with what is perceived to bring back together uh, perceptions and conceptions, to view sensory inputs in conceptual knowledge really being the same thing. So the idea here is that both perceptual and conceptual processes are culturally constructed. And that's another dualism that I think needs to be transcended. And again, that's a little difficult to, to talk about, but there's been a lot of work by historians and anthropologists with this idea of how the senses are not something innate. The, the senses are not something inborn. It's rather, we, rather cultures train and cultivate how we perceive the world. 
And that may be a very subtle process. And because it's very subtle, it may not be very obvious. So for example, when somebody in another culture sees a picture and they describe that picture to us, we can probably relate to their description. But at a deeper level within the mind of that individual, that picture is going to symbolize and represent and implicate many different, many things that are not obvious to a person looking at that same picture from a different culture. So there are different layers of information when we perceive something. Um, and uh, uh, so in any case, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure if that, that, that's, that's sort of a, a, not an easy point to make, that this idea that even our perception, even our senses are culturally constructed, that there's nothing natural about perception. I mean, if you talk to many research psychologists, their assumption is that everyone has the same senses and therefore everyone processes information in the same way. But the claim I'm making, it's much more complicated than that. That culture plays a very profound role, not just in conception of the world, but also in the very act of perception of the world. Uh, and then uh, the, the, the last point I'd make, and this is where uh, the, there's some intersection, I think, with prior discussions in, in these meetups with what uh, Marshall McLuhan claimed uh, about sense ratios, about in each culture, there's going to be a different balance or different relation, we might say, between the different senses. And uh, it, it, I, one, I, I don't have any evidence for the, the claim I'm about to make. Um, and I think some people would agree, there's certainly a lot of evidence for it, that people are becoming more uh, more, we're becoming as a species more visually oriented. And, and again, that, that's, that's, that's just a claim. I just throw it out there for discussion. What does that mean exactly? Um, uh, is it true? I mean, certainly I think it's evident that depending on the historical period, depending on the cultural place that you look, you can see a very, uh, you see very different uh, sense ratios. And again, this has to do with larger socio-political economic forces that shape the, 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 the cultural landscape and that shape how we perceive things. Um, so in any case, I'll, I'll end there. And um, if anyone has any questions um, or any commentary, of course, uh, I'd be happy to hear what people have to say. Wonderful. Uh, so Brian, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to, uh, let's elaborate on a couple of points, the most complex points that you made. So first one is the concept of these sense ratios. And you can see that very clearly. And if, even if we start off with the same senses, the extent to which you, we end up using the senses varies. Um, and the amount of emphasis that we place on it, amount of time we spent using it, uh, amount of use of it, you know, what are the various ways in which you use it, that varies from culture to cul culture and person to person. Yes. So what you're saying with visuality in Japan is that the Japanese culture has been using the visual field in a very different way. And in a far more, in a way which is far more deeply integrated into the way in which the culture functions than the West. Would would that be a fair thing to say? Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think it has to come with some caution. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, I'm not claiming that therefore Westerners are excluded from the cultural landscape of Japan. It, it just makes it would take more work for an American or European sometimes to appreciate what's going on in Japan's everyday cultural landscape. Absolutely. Uh, so I want to connect one more point. One of my favorite quotes um, or disciplines that Leonardo da Vinci talks about is learning how to see. You know, mm. people think that you have eyes, you just see. No, no, no. You, you actually have to train 
your eyes. And the only way to train your eyes how to see is to start drawing and start making visual things. So you're using your this mechanism of the motor mechanism and the perceptual mechanism in order to build visual things that are at the same time conceptual, conceptually structured. So you're so that is very different level of operation using the visual field than simply opening the eyes like you know a child a newborn can they can't even focus their eyes i mean there's something coming in even focusing the eyes require it require effort in in you know in the in the beginning right. um so i think there there is kind of training involved um the the most um amazing point um, to talk about is this percepts and concepts. So uh, when we had Peter Buckman here, he was talking about one of McLuhan's ideas, percepts, not concepts. So what he means is that you always start, and this is also connects, I mean, this, the point you're making about duality, right? Lack of duality. That was the same point uh, that we discussed last Sunday when Mark Barker was here talking about the cogitative sense uh, as per Thomas Aquinas. Uh, this is again, the same way that Aristotle approaches things. Um, dualism is kind of platonic of saying that there are forms mm -hmm. which are separate. And then there is this real world, which is not real anyway, something like that, to, you know, to put it very, you know, in a car caricature way, but the Aristotelian way or the Aquinas way or what Marshall McLuhan is talking about is that concepts come from percepts. So you to start with percepts in order to come up with concepts. And the only way in which concepts are being used is to convert them back into percepts. So they are not two separate things. Those are, you know, those are two different angles on the same, same thing. Yes. Um, and that, that's a very profound point. It's, it's uh, because what, what, uh, what you have to do is that it actually, you, you talked about, I like your term of the, how visuality rational, you know, kind of makes rational and disciplines the senses. So what happens is that if you regard that as a standard, then what you produce visually, the standards are sky high because they have to match your conceptual requirements of functioning. Um, so so th those are my, my comments. So in, any, any thoughts? Yes. So actually, you brought up um, uh, a lot of very important things, and I'll, I'll comment on two or three of them. I, I, I think the what's happened in, uh, I don't like to say the West, so I'll say what's happened in modern times, because that applies to uh, not just the West, but any society that's been modernized, especially the past 100, 200 years. We buy into this dualism, mind-body dualism, which then implies uh, uh, perception, conception, uh, uh, duality. And it's very powerful that it allows research scientists to understand certain things about how the mind works. But there's a downside. And that downside is that we don't see, how, as you pointed out, how actually uh, percepts and concepts are the same thing in a sense. So we, we're good at analyzing, taking things apart in laboratories, but we don't know how to put them back together. We resist putting them back together. And I think that distorts what it means to be uh, a person. And as you said, this idea, we begin with a perception and then we, uh, we build a conception based on that perception, often through metaphors. And so there's a, there's a very, uh, there's something very bodily or embodied about the mind. And the examples that I gave some weeks ago, of course, had to do with Julian Jaynes and talking about how metaphoric language is able to construct uh, this sense of a uh, internal uh, space, a sort of subjective, introspectable uh, self-awareness. And then, and so basically we're talking about so, uh, object-subject duality. And that is what modern science since the enlightenment is based on. And as I said, it's a very powerful thing to take the subject out of the equation and look at the world as this distant objective reality. It has its uses, it's very powerful, but I think we're, we're enamored with it too much. As I said, I think it, it prevents us from seeing more subtle things going on. 
and then just one more point I'll throw out there to really mess up and complicate it and complicate everything that we've been talking about. So there's this duality of perception and conception, but I would throw in, uh, I, I think it's a triunity. I would throw in another layer of uh, processing that I would call introception. And introception is just another word for Jamesian consciousness or conscious interiority. And so again, we don't have to talk about it today, but I just want to throw it out there that I see the human mind operating in three, uh, three layers of, or three levels, if you will, perception, conception, and introception. And introception is just the mental space in my mind. And so the question to me is how these three things that seem so different are actually uh, interrelated. Okay, so let me, I, I cannot resist, uh, Brian. So I have to ask you, so how, how is uh, interception related to percepts and concepts? If you wanted to give a short answer. Okay, well, I'll try. So, well. Uh, um, you can take five minutes. Okay. Because this is a very important question. No, you're right. It is. So perception. So, so well, let's start with introception. So intro, introceptions are built upon conception and conceptions are built on perceptions. So we have a bodily experience that is translated somehow into a conception. Uh, so, so for example, I, I, I see uh, a person in a room, that's my perception, then that becomes more sophisticated as a conception. I can memorize that scene. I can manipulate it, move it around in my head, but it's only a conception. I'm not conscious of it. I don't become conscious of it until it moves to introception. And introception is the actual imaginary space in my head that most people have. And that's where Jane's comes in. So the problem in English and in many modern languages is we use these words interchangeably, perception, conception, and conscious awareness, or for lack of a better term. We don't even really have a good word. That's why consciousness is so problematic. We don't have a good word. That's why I invented this word, <laughs> introception, because, but they're all basically related. They're all a type of recording of experience. It's just that right now for Homo sapiens, the most sophisticated, the most advanced level of mentation is uh, introception, you know, to put it simply. But like I said, the problem talking and writing and researching these issues is that we're still stuck on duality of perception, conception. But I think we have to introduce another level or layer uh, of whatever you want to call it of introception. Um, and, and, and get away from this uh, 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 subject-object duality. So I, I'm not sure if that uh, ex explains it. Now, I think we can, that's the best we can do in five minutes, but we, we should do an entire meetup on this because uh, it's what, what it is is that it's, so there is kind of uh, the best I understand it. So what, what happens is that the, the core idea of Julian Jaynes is this idea of mental space where you are, um, you're able to put things hypothetically and see the patterns in that. So it's, it's about another way of putting it is that it's about awareness of what is there in your uh, consciousness. So it is your awareness of your concepts, it's awareness of your percepts and ability to manipulate those things. So right. it is like a higher level control uh, mechanism Right. And let, let, just let me, you're, you're right. And let me interrupt you. W one way to clarify all this is perception and conception are not conscious. And so we perceive things all the time. We conceive things all the time, but we're not conscious. The only thing we're conscious of is what is in that mental space of introception. And that's where the confusion comes in, because in everyday standard English, we use conception as if our concepts are conscious, but I don't think they are. I think we have to, you know, we can be, once we become conscious of a concept, then it becomes an introcept. Mm -hmm. So again, it's, you know, it, the, 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 our, the lang our language is just not equipped to make these distinctions. That's why there's a lot of confusion 
Uh, no, this is this is fascinating. This is fascinating stuff. So I would love to you know follow up on that. I want to make one last point, and then we'll open it up to questions. So it's going to be Elena and uh, Patricia next. But one last question uh, or one last um, comparison is with uh, Marshall McLuhan's ideas, idea that medium is the message. Mm -hmm. What happens is that if you end up using a certain medium, like the visual medium or the audio medium a lot, a lot, like for example, people watch TV in America. I'm always astonished whenever I see the stats of the number of hours people. So that does something for, to you and the, it affects your default process of operating. Yeah. Similarly, when at a time, uh, you know, people used to read lots of books. So when you read books, you go sequentially, you know, you read sequentially. So then you get, your mind gets used to moving sequentially. So that is kind of privileged that that process of the mind, it's a left brain kind of process gets privileged. Um, here in TV, if you're watching a lot of TV, it is acoustic. So you're taking in both images, almost like a, you're taking in a performance and you're listening in a passive way. So certain, so the way in which you're using your senses changes. Similarly, this visuality of Japan, you're using visual objects. That's another kind of, so you're actually using this media to train how your mind works. And then your mind is affected by that. So there is a causality between the media that you end up using and how your mind is functioning. So any comments on that? Um, I don't have anything in particular to say. I, th I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think what I see the challenge is, is coming up with specific examples of that. They're probably out there. Uh, and the reason why it's a bit of a challenge is because this process of uh, you know, meeting as a message can take two or three centuries bef before we see a real impact. Um, and, let's, and unless you're really paying attention to things happening on the ground, on the cultural landscape, these subtle changes are di very difficult to miss. But, but definitely, I think you're right. Um, I, I think, I, I mean, uh, one difference I noticed when I came back from Japan in 2003 to teach in the United States, I, I was struck by how students had a hard time with textual information. Well, what I mean is when I gave them a syllabus, they wouldn't really read it. The only thing they would pay attention to would be something visual. And I, and I think that's very different from my generation. When I went to university in the late 70s, early 80s, I mean, there were visual images and there were diagrams and pictures, of course. But the idea is you could give someone information in textual form and they would process that. They would absorb it. But I was struck. Uh, there does seem to be a change. Um, and so I think we will see more of these, these changes of how the medium uh, does affect the message. Yes, and and uh, and folks, the medium has just changed. We have the digital medium, we have the computers, which is changing everything over all over again. So, um, all right. So with that, I'm going to open it for questions. It's going to be Elena, uh, Patricia, and Dave next. Uh, folks, uh, rules: uh, go ahead and type exclamation mark when you want to ask a question. Uh, keep it brief. Um, keep on topic. And feel free to disagree with anybody on anything, but do so courteously. Next up is Elena. Go ahead, Elena. Um, Brian, Brian and Srikant. Brian, this is amazing. And thank you. It's really fascinating. And you brought up great points. Um, my question is, you've been, you've been in Japan. You've, you've absorbed the culture. So what would be the most uh, popular social messages that are being conveyed through imagery, visually? social messages or um, advertising marketing like what how what's being say uh, sent to general public uh, from your perspective because every country would have different like you know agenda so thank what you. do you thank you so much uh thank you elena for that questions so i'll try to answer it the best i can um i i don't I, I, nothing in particular comes to mind. Uh, uh, I don't think there's a one overriding agenda in terms of conveying information visually in Japan. Uh, but at the same time, um, I do think uh, 
that uh, if I had to answer your question the best I can, I'd say that advertising and marketing, again, this capitalist consumerism, which is not unique to Japan, of course, but what I'm saying is if you look at most of the images in Japan, they have to do with trying to instill within people a desire to buy something, whether it's on TV, out on the street. You know, the other thing I would say is that um, sexualized images are, uh, again, I haven't been to Japan in a while, but when I was there, that was one thing that really struck me at how public sexualized images were. Um, not that all Japanese like that or agree with it, but uh, I mean, there's a feminist movement in Japan, of course, but um, they, they, were, they would show uh, erotic images in places in Japan, have visual images of them that, that at least in the United States, you could not do. I mean, those images, of course, exist in, in the United States, but uh, so that, that's just more a, a, of a comment. But to get back to the, the original point I made, I don't think there's, there's no overriding agenda except for uh, uh, advertising and marketing and trying to turn people into uh, consumers. So there's, there's a definite economic uh, aspect to what goes on in visuality in Japan. Next up is Patricia, Dave, and Beatrice. Patricia. Hi, thank you, Brian. This is very interesting. I'm curious about your term introception um, and whether how whether you're familiar with the term interoception and if those are two different terms. Um, actually, the the second term you mentioned, I, I'm not familiar with it. How, is that there is a word? I think maybe this is what you're referring to. I could be wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong. Where it's a sense, it's it, it, it's a inner bodily sense. Is that what you meant by that second term? Right. Um, in in terms of like sensory processing, you okay. know, we are looking at more than you know. People typically think of five senses. Right. And but then there's seven senses. You know, the vestibular sense, the proprioceptive. But they've also introduced the new concept of interoception, which is our internal organs, you know, our response to hunger, thirst, you know, feeling tired. Right. Whereas I think your introception is more of an introspective. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you. That's a, a really good question. Um, and it, it gives me an opportunity to, to clarify uh, what, what I mean by interception. And so uh, perception and uh, inner sensory, interoception, um, a sense of balance. So, so we have all these sort of uh, innate perceptions. Those perceptions, for the most part, we're not even aware of, we're not conscious of them. Uh, we can become, become conscious of them, but then they become, uh, for, for lack of a better term, interiorized percepts or, or just introceptions. So this is what I mean about the English language. It's very difficult to pin these things down, but, but definitely the, the main point is I'm, I am talking about something very different. When I use the word introception, um, it's not, nothing to do with uh, interiorception or, or inner senses. Uh, next up is Dave. Yeah, thanks Brian. Fascinating talk as always. I uh, was going to ask you about the manga or, or make a comment. Uh, I've seen the description anime uh, or for these cartoon characters, but the thing that struck me, look at these images, is the hair. And uh, very politically incorrect here, but to me, you know, in their homogeneous culture, everyone has long, straight black hair that I wonder if it's a reaction to, to individualize the characters. They're drawing individual strands of hair and some of the hair is very stylized. Is that something you'd noticed? Yes, so that, that's, that's a good point. So, yeah, so in Japan, I think people who haven't traveled to Japan often assume that all Japanese uh, have black hair and traditionally they have, of course. However, I don't know, starting in maybe the late, 80s or 90s, many young Japanese started to dye their hair, uh, all types of colors. Uh, so some of them, to me, not ter not terribly appealing, 
Um, but in any case, and you see this represented in anime and in manga too. Um, and why why would you, why were young Japanese doing that? Uh, of course, I think it's a way to resist the authorities. It, it's a way to uh, find their own individuality. And I've mentioned this before when we talked about Japan, uh, this idea of individualistic uh, uh, personalities. It, so J Japanese are just as concerned about the individuality as anyone, any Westerner might be, any American might be. But they are under tr tremendous uh, educational pressures to fit in. So when I was in Japan, there were uh, cases where some families sued the educational authorities because they were upset because a teacher uh, cut someone's hair because it was too long or a teacher objected to something that they did to their hair. So there, there's a, at the time, there was a very politicized element to hair in Japan. And it's sort of the darker side to Japanese life, I think. Uh, it shows you how uh, serious um, the educational and political authorities are when it comes to trying to give this idea that Japanese are one big happy family, that they're all the same. Of course, that's not true. It can't be in such a big place such as Japan. Um, and what ha typically when I was in Japan, when students would go, when, after they would graduate from high school and go to university or college, they would let it all hang out because for four years they could do whatever they wanted to do. And that's when they would really let their individuality shine and become very individualistic. And as part of that, uh, they would change their hair color, grow their hair long, um, whatever. Um, <clears throat> just one more point about this. There's uh, the, some people, would comment that, oh, the Japanese are trying to look Western by dyeing their hair blonde or changing their hair color. And, you, and this, this would be re represented in manga. And I don't think that's what they were doing. I don't think they were trying to change their Japanese-ness. I think that they were just trying to give a very different version of their Japanese-ness uh, as a way to uh, rebel, you might say, or stand up against uh, the authorities. <coughs> Thank you. Next up is uh, Beatrice, followed by Ever and Jeff. Beatrice. Uh, Beatrice, you need to unmute yourself. Okay, let me see. I have a question from her. Give me a second. Uh, she says, uh, would you comment that perhaps the food images... Oh. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Beatrice. Oh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm able to un unmute. So my question is a bit of a, a, a challenge and I would like some um, elaboration. I have been to Japan uh, several times and um, I noticed, uh, of course, the food images. And in my mind, um, it, it is uh, related to the obvious fact that uh, Japanese, uh, not foreigners, mostly, I would, I would surmise, do not speak or read Japanese. So this would be the obvious and most easy way for people to see what's on a menu. Um, and, and I would bring up uh, not just uh, Eastern, but Western and, and South American and Bonham Pack, even in cave drawings, visualization has been um, the typical medium to express a message to non-literate people. Okay, so to uh, to to respond, um, you know, I, I, if I understand correctly what you said, uh, that you, you you seem to say that the reason why they use food samples in Japan is because uh, many foreigners don't read Japanese, um, but there there are very very few foreigners uh, in Japan. There are foreigners. There are more foreigners now, of course, but I'm talking about the vast majority of people living in Japan, especially in the late 19th century, before World War II, in the immediate post-war period. Most people who would go to stores or to coffee shops or restaurants were going to be Japanese. So I don't think it has anything to do with language. Certainly, it makes it easier for foreign tourists um, but 
you know, when they, they look at uh, the, 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 the storefront or the, 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 into the, the window of, of a restaurant, of course, it makes it easier if they see a visual representation, three-dimensional representation of the food. Um, but I, I, I just don't see that being the main reason. I think the main reason is because um, many Japanese are just more comfortable with looking at things uh, visually. Thank you. Next up is going to be Ever, Jeff, and Jean. Ever. Hi, everyone, and thank you for this, Brian. Um, I'm going to follow one from... Uh, Ever, could you speak into the mic? Is that any better? A little better, yes. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm going to follow one from Beatrice's question and ask you about the literacy rates in Japan. I have a suspicion that there is a reason why they go for the visual, and I think it has more to do with the capacity to be literate, their read and write levels, then it is just a necessity for the visual. So offhand, I'm not sure what the literacy rate is in Japan. Um, I suspect it's very high. I, in fact, I would venture a guess, I could be wrong that it's probably higher than it is in the United States. Uh, Japanese edu the Japanese education system does have some serious problems, especially when you get to the high school, university, college level. But the literacy at, rate is 99%. Okay, yeah. So I, it's, it's very, very high. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if it has to do with um, uh, uh, a low literacy rate, why they like to use uh, food samples. Uh, next up is uh, Jeff, followed by Gene. Jeff. So, um, Brian, I thought it was it was fascinating when you went from kind of the examples of, of uh, visualization to then this whole prioritization of, um, of the use of senses and the implications for perception conception and introspection that just blew my mind when, when you went from, from A to B to C there. And I, um, I do a lot of work with teams that are engaged in trying to figure out what to do in very complicated situations. And what we've discovered is that when there are presentations of things in a, in a, in a, in a flip chart or um, PowerPoint framework, that as, as Srikant said, are using words um, that people see things in linear ways rather than seeing the whole. And when we brought in graphic artists who then display an entire conversation as a picture, the relationship between things, whether it's a theory or a situation or a scenario in the future, becomes completely different. And everybody takes a picture of it so that they can then go share it with whomever they're presenting it. I just, um, I've noticed that, uh, sur been surprised by it. And I just wonder if you have any comment about those different uh, representations and presentations of, of, of situations, theories, and scenarios. Yeah, so that, that's a fascinating point that you made, Jeff. Um, I mean, there's not much I could say except to say that I, I think what you seem to be saying is correct, that um, we, in modern societies, we have this uh, overriding assumption that the most efficient, sophisticated, mature way to convey information is through text. And of course, text, it can be very efficient. There's a reason why we developed it as a species. However, um, at the same time, I mean, we have that saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. And, uh, you know, not for nothing. I, I think there's a, a tremendous amount of truth behind that. Um, so, you know, it might be a little more challenging for different reasons when we, when we present something in pictorial or visual form, but nevertheless, um, I think people just feel more comfortable with, uh, with, with something that's presented visually. It, 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 they, they, there's a more, react, a more reactive instinctive part of the brain perhaps that just absorbs the whole rather than breaking things down and processing. I mean, that's a very complex 
uh, a process that has that has to occur anytime you use print or text. So I'm glad to hear that there's something, uh, you know, you talked about something very useful and practical. And uh, I think that's a really good point to bring up that what we're talking about is not just abstract, it's not just academic, that this has real world uses, real, real world implications, what we're talking about. Thank you. Next up is Jean. Yeah, it's quite fascinating because uh, I think we, uh, Shere Khan, we have a group discuss about the, the language. I think it also shows very differently. Eastern language is more graphical and the Western language is more abstract. I think it's a different thinking method, the way we present things. Because personally, I found in China the same thing. You know, all the manuals, you have graphic of the food and also the graphic of the whole manual is like artwork. You have point all the all the you know the good restaurant all the uh, dishes actually you write into a poem it's just beautiful so it's it's I don't see so when I eat the uh, when I read the Western manual I have to figure out what exactly they try to say you know it's so much I said why don't they just take a picture it's much easier so <laughs> I see you know maybe it's a different brain like the language the the I see the eastern part of the world is more filler, the like the sensing type is more developed. On the Western side is more the abstract thinking, more developed. That's why it's dominant. Not everybody that way, but it's dominant culture. Mm -hmm. That's I think part of the reason in Asian, in Japan and China, they're more visual because they're more filler. And I'm a thinker actually. That's why I come to America and feel more comfortable. <laughs> and I more associate with Aristotle's thinking but I think there are a lot of more majority of them are more feeler sensing type of people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I wonder what you think about. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think in general, you're right. I think that um, we, have, we have to be a little bit careful. We don't want to overstress or essentialize differences between the Euro-American world and then uh, uh, Asia, uh, Japan, China. Uh, I mean, we have to pay attention, I think, to both the commonalities and uh, differences. Um, uh, because, I mean, after all, an American can learn Japanese, uh, a, a Chinese can learn uh, a European language. So these, these, these differences, these distinctions, they're, they're not very deep, but I think that they're deep enough that we should pay attention to them and comment on them. All right, so we, we've been in a very interesting um, room with the discussion about uh, so what it is in a, as a whole. So there is a, and something that came to mind is that there is a visual message and this visual message is being absorbed consciously, subconsciously, unconsciously. So there are different ways how we perceive information and what we do with this information. And um, then the message could be amplified with, uh, say, something else that you attach to it. So say what, what uh, Dave said in the room, like that there is Cinnabon. So if you have Cinnabon business, right, in, a, in an airport or anywhere location, you would be approaching it and you would, you would know ahead of time that where you're going because of all this smell. And so there is a, already you, you combine two channels of perceiving information or giving the message. It's smell and visual. And this is an extremely, extremely powerful thing. So it's um, uh, something that we as humans don't use as much. And, and when I was talking about the country, like the whole country could give you the message in this particular way, if you have an agenda, say. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's used as much. And that's what came to me, like in political campaigns or if you want to give social message. But anyhow, I, will, I want to see what everyone thinks about it. And Brian, the, so thank you. Thank you so much. Brian, go ahead. Uh, Brian, you're on mute. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I think the point you made about the different perceptual modes is very important, actually, because uh, usually 
when we think of perception, often there's a bias toward visual or auditory. But in fact, we do absorb information um, through smell, through touch, through taste. Um, and so I, I think that's important to keep in mind, uh, especially if someone has an agenda. And so I can't really comment on in Japan uh, uh, using senses for political campaigns, what the political agenda might be. Uh, but certainly when it comes to the agenda of corporations and businesses, I think that's very obvious. I think that's very clear that um, it's all about marketing and uh, advertising. It doesn't mean that advertising and marketing are always successful in what they're trying to accomplish, which is to get people to have desires to buy things. Um, but certainly that, 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 that's a re actually, that's a real, key characteristic of modern societies is consumerism and all the advertising <clears throat> that goes along with it. And it's one of these things that it's because it's such an everyday part, it's such a ubiquitous part of the landscape, we take it for granted. But I was just thinking the other day about advertising and advertising, when you, whether it's TV commercials, whatever it is, there's something almost religious about it. <laughs> You know, so we talk about psychology and politics has taken the place of religion in the modern world. <clears throat> I think we can make the claim that advertising and instilling these desires and, and, and these wishes and longings has, have all, has also taken the place of uh, the religious impulse. Thank you. Uh, next up is Jean. Yeah, I was thinking about the, we talk about media as message. So I wonder, you know, because we had the media before, as mentioned about paper and digital, all this. I think the reason, it seems we were discussing about why some people assume the reason they use graphic because people are illiterate. And I was wondering, you know, what is education? You know, like we use language, abstract language to present reality, but the reality actually we lose reality during the process. So because we were limited by paper before, so we don't have a better way to convey the message. Now we have much more powerful tools to convey more fully message. Why we still seem obsessed with this, this old media of so-called literature as only way. You know, we can represent the reality with much, but the, at the same time, it's easy to get lost, but we can represent in a much multimedia way. You know, so do we, is our mind still old to grasp to the old media to limit ourselves as expression. I just wonder about that. So it's, it seems to me that um, actually a couple of ideas popped into my head while you <clears throat> listening to you. It may not be directly related to what you said. Um, so this idea about representing reality, there are a lot of um, philosophers uh, other researchers who talk about what has happened in the modern world because it is so mediated, whether it's textual mediation, whether it's through print, whether it's visual mediation, putting layers between the, the, the perceiver and um, whatever message is trying to be conveyed, all, all these different layers, actually, we have to ask ourselves, is reality being represented? And of course, the French philosopher, uh, Baudrillard talked about hyper-reality, that there's a, a reality that goes beyond everyday ordinary reality. And that hyper-reality actually is generated, it's caused, I think, by modern technologies with all these layers of mediation. So for, this, this impacts the social world. So for example, people in, using so, social media and Facebook, how many friends do I have? Uh, you know, people have 1,200 friends. Well, of course, we know that individual does not really have 1,200 friends. They may think that they do. That's an example of what happens when there's too much mediation, when technology overtakes what it, what it means to be a person. And related to this is this idea of, related to losing reality, I suppose, is this idea of just too much information. That's not an original point to make, of course, but it, it, re, it resonates with what Julian James said about why the bicameral mind broke down in the first place. There were too many voices. People were being given too many instructions by too many gods. And I think in the modern world, in a sense, we're seeing the same thing play out. Our technology has opened up too many channels 
of communication and um you know what 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 does that mean of course there are many many it means it causes uh many different problems but in any case i, I thought i'd just make that point thank you next up is madeline folks if you uh, want to ask questions or give a brief take away uh you're welcome to type exclamation mark madeline yes thank you shrikant and thank you brian um i have a question or actually something i wanted brian to expand upon a bit I had a uh, housemate many years ago, he was Japanese and he got a little dog and she was wonderful. Uh, it was a breed I knew. And when she was uh, focused on looking at something, when she was paused before running after it, she would lift one forepaw up, it was dangling. So if she'd been a big hunting dog, we would have called it pointing in English, but, um, my housemate called it the thinking paw, hmm. which I just thought was so charming. And when I heard you talk about, um, I think it was thinking with the eye or the thinking, the thinking eye, how we think with our different senses. I thought of uh, my old housemate and the thinking paw. And I thought perhaps you could uh, talk a little bit more about um, apprehension in the sense of grasping things uh, with the eye? Uh, sh sure, I, I mean, it's um, it's a little difficult to talk about it because it's, 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 it's something that we're not used to thinking about, I suppose, but it, it all goes back to this movement in philosophy of rather than trying to understand what it means to be human in terms of our rational, sophisticated intellect, this sort of realm of ideas floating around in our head, the idea is to start with the body. And that's why I use these expressions, eyes that uh, think or eyes that desire. Uh, and of course, you gave the example of the thinking Paul. That, 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 I think that's a really, I, I think it, that is a, a parallel uh, to what I had to say, this idea how parts of our, that it, you cannot understand what it means to be human. You can't understand human psychology unless you look at it from the perspective of the body. And then of course that includes our different perceptual uh, modalities. And as, as I said before, that's very difficult to do because we're so used to this dualism of what goes on inside my head versus what goes on, not just the outside world, but what goes on my body. And uh, there's this idea that this interior existence inside me is my true ultimate self when in fact, um, we, we are still bodily beings. And to go off on a bit of a tangent here, because it, it does relate to what you're talking about, this idea of how the body plays a role in processing information. In a lot of counseling, certain uh, psychotherapeutic traditions, for example, Gestalt therapy, uh, rely a lot on, uh, on the body, getting to know your own body and uh, also techniques using mental imagery. In a sense, mental imagery, even though we associate mental imagery with something introceptive or introspective, the truth of the matter is that mental images are built on perceptions. You cannot have a mental image in your mind unless you uh, first have a, perce uh, a perception of it. And so these, again, there's a practical application to everything we're talking about. Th th these things can be used to help people cure their minds by using things like uh, mental imagery, but we have to transcend this mind-body dualism in order to get there. Uh, thank you, Brian. So uh, I had one question. Uh, this is about the script. Now, the Chinese script or the Japanese script they're very visual. So that they're, you know, they're, they're like little pictures and many, 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 many of them as opposed to alphabet. Do you think that has anything to do with more focus on visuality in the Japanese and Chinese culture as opposed to, as compared to West? Um, that, it's difficult to answer uh, definitively. I it's intuitively, it certainly seems that way because you ha have to learn. Uh, I mean, unlike a Western language where you have to learn 26 letters, um, of course, 
with uh, Chinese, you have to learn at least several thousand, if not more. Uh, same thing in in Japanese, um, you 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 have to learn a, uh, a large number of ideograms. But you know, at the same time, in English, it's not just if you, to use English as an example, it's not just about learning uh, the, the different individual letters. It's learning how they form words, of course, an infinite number of words. So it's, it's, there's also that level of complexity. But like I said, it, it's difficult to answer. I, I think it, mm -hmm. it, it may have something to do with it. That's certainly the view that many people have that because they use in Chinese and Japanese uh, ideograms that they're gonna be more comfortable with visual, um, the visual uh, pr presentation of information. Wonderful. Uh, next up is Kevin. Uh, I would value your question, Suek. Yes, it, it is. Let's see, find out with Japanese words, how do you write it? Is it the sun rise? The first it is, that's uh, like a sun. It, you look at, it's like sun. The middle is like sun rising. So, which means we look for every word we're looking at have a picture behind mine. And we, interpret the meaning, like we pronounce it in different Japanese and Chinese, but we know the meaning. So it, 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 it totally makes sense. Absolutely, that's a root, one, even one of a big factor. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, thank you, Kevin. Appreciate that. Um, all right, uh, folks, if you have uh, questions, you can go ahead and type an exclamation mark. Um, so uh, let's see. I mean, Brian, this is a humongous topic. Um, and I really like this series on Japan. Uh, I think it's going really, really well. Um, I think we are able to explore different things. And I like your approach where you are both kind of making your, your you make no bones about seeing general patterns. At the same time, you make very clear uh, contextualization of saying that, look, there is this variation you're talking about this uh, general pattern. So this is immensely useful because when the general pattern somewhere else is different than the general pattern that you're used to in the West, in our day-to-day -day life, it is, it's really interesting to see, okay, what does that lead to? You know, what kind, what, what, what would be the consequences of it? And Jeff had a very interesting example of bringing it to, you know, applying it to, to presentations as being kind of like the universal thing that you can people can very easily carry you know it becomes more portable because you have everything in there um, and people can just see the relationships uh, directly so I, I think that's very good uh, Elena you had a question um yes I do and hold on let me I have an iPhone talking right here so I'm just going to hide the iPhone sure Elena just keep it brief okay yeah, so very brief. Um, to question to Brian and Kevin, do you have, once you see an image, and um, I've been to Asian countries, but like Japan, okay, when you see an image, do you have also a sense of feeling associated with it? Um, say, very good. It, so that's my question. Excellent. Uh, Kevin, you want to go first? Uh, I didn't get the question. What's the... The, the question is that when you see an image, uh, when you see a letter, uh, does it also give you a certain feeling associated with it? Or is it oh. just visual images? Yes, uh, it's the family, I mentioned, you know, last time about A and B, mm -hmm. it's the alphabet. The A is like an ox hat used to be. No, 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 no not, not A and B, uh, yeah. the, the, the Chinese alphabets. Oh, uh, definitely, okay. yes. Okay. Got yes, it. they got it so complicated, like a word, like a family heart. We use like you, we, in English, we only have you. Like in Chinese, we have you on the heart, bottom of heart, which means respect, especially you are host or the present or at least that uh, little bit up level. Like Japanese, the bold that had, right? That's means respect, audience, and our opponent side. So it, it, it's, it is wonderful. Definitely. Thank you. Brian? So uh, um, I. I started to learn Japanese in my uh, mid twenties, actually. So, um, but there are definitely some words that resonate with me uh, that did sort of have an emotional 
pulled, you might say. Um, the wor a word that comes to mind is kokoro, which is uh, means heart in Japanese. So the symbol for uh, a heart. Uh, but in any case, uh, because it, it means so many things in Japanese, um, and I'm trying to think of uh, other examples, but in any case, there, 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 there was a, uh, there is a, um, a short list, I suppose, of Japanese words that do resonate with me emotionally uh, for whatever reason. Um, and I, I should add that this is a bit related that when, uh, when people, when an English speaker learns Japanese, at least when I learned Japanese, of course, the object is to be able to look at a Japanese character uh, and know what it, to be able to pronounce it and of course know what it means. But to get there, I had to rely on the English language. So when I would see the word, the, the, the Japanese ideogram kokoro for heart, I would have to spell that out, K-O-K-O-R-O. -O -O. And I would have to memorize that. And so there are, because I was brought up learning English, there's that linguistic layer in my head that I had to get, that I, I would use it to learn Japanese, but at the same time, eventually I would have to transcend that layer of alf the alphabetic layer, if you will, because it gets in the way of truly feeling comfortable with um, an ideogram based language. Well, um, Brian, I have a couple of things that I want to follow up on, but um, do you have anything that you could not cover in the uh, in the main talk that you would like to talk about, anything else that you would like to add uh, for today? For today, um, yes. So there is something, um, and it has to do with uh, onomatopoeia. And uh, if anyone has studied Japanese, they'll know that in Japanese, they make a tremendous use of these words. Um, you know what's what's an example in English like bow wow or meow? Uh, those words, those types of words in English, are sort of considered something that, like childish almost that mature people don't use. That's very very different in Japanese. Many of their adverbs and adjectives rely on onomatopoeia. It's a very vital part of the Japanese language. And Can you go no... ahead and define anomatopoeia for, for the audience? What is it? So, well, like the example I, I gave, mm -hmm. bow wow, to, to, you know, usually we say a dog barks, but the idea is to rely on something more perceptual, the sound. Mm -hmm. You know, okay. dogs don't really sound mm -hmm. like bow wow when mm -hmm. they try to talk, I guess, but, mm -hmm. but that's the idea. And mm -hmm. some languages use those a lot. English has them, but we don't ordinarily use them in written language or to express abstract ideas, but they use them a lot in Japanese. And I actually wrote an article about it. I think it has to do with their uh, use of perception with visuality. So I, I, you know, off the top of my head right now, I can't think of uh, any, some, some examples, um, but um, but 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 there are many examples. So the connection is between perception, language, and complicated thought, and how these are related in Japanese. Uh, many examples of uh, anomotopeia. Um, you know, I'm sure we can all stop and think of some examples. From yeah, no, that's English. that's that's good. Um, I just want to make one point. A point. Actually, let's go. Let's have uh, Patricia go first, and then I'll make the point. Patricia, go ahead. Yeah, just along that line, I'm thinking about you know back in the day with the Batman TV series, we would you would have Kapow and Kazam, and sh you know when when the, ever Batman punched somebody. So I'm thinking that in, in terms of you know in American culture, um, that was some an example. Yes, yes, that's right. Excellent. Um, so um, the point I wanted to make was about this common sense, the uh, what Aquinas called common sense, where all these sensations are not really separate. They actually pull together into percepts. So think of an apple, right? Think of an apple in your hand right in front of you. So you have the visual you have the feel of the apple in your hand, you have the smell, and 
take an apple where, where you have already taken a bite. So you have the, the taste. So when you're looking at the percept of the apple, all of these things are kind of combined together mm -hmm. in your percept of the apple um, all, all together. And some of these senses actually, they, they're, there is a commonality of the senses where each of the senses kind of help the other. Uh, there is the famous Kiki Buba experiment where, uh, uh, Brian, you're familiar with that, right? No, I'm not sure. Okay, so, so then this is very, very simple. So the, it's very simple experiment. So th you're saying that there are two things. One is called Kiki and one is called Buba. And people are shown different shapes. One is a, like a cloud-like shape and one is a very sharp, distinct. And say, okay, which one is Kiki and which one is Buba? Oh, okay. And 90, 95%, 99% of the people point to the cloud-like thing and, oh, that's Buba. And the sharp thing is Kiki. Okay. Uh, at the same time, the color. So if something like the Buba is generally like purple, if you choose purple and orange, the orange is generally Kiki. It's kind of sharp, yeah. attention-catching thing. Whereas Buba is kind of more mellow, Thing. So, so there is like this combination of sounds, colors, um, and visuals all together that, that kind of go flow together. And it looks like what you're saying is that in Japanese visuality, they make use of those things. Yeah. So in this anomatopoeia example, they're using the sound. They're also doing the visuals both in characters and in actual physical arrangements of things. And they're using that as a base for having advanced concepts, yes. you know, of, and, and, and making things happen and, you know, using them to actually act. Yes. Um, that, that's, that's exactly uh, what's going on. And, you know, like I said, I, I published an entire article on this. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know if it's if if, if uh, you can peep. I don't I, I don't know if I have the uh, original in digital form myself because it was a long time ago. Um, but uh, you know, I I, I'll, I can send you the, uh, the the link to it if if anyone's interested. Sure. Because I, I think that that was my attempt to show how perception, conception, and introception are really very, very much entangled. And you can't talk about one without the other. There are so many excellent examples in Japanese of that. You find examples in any language, but it was very clear in the case of Japanese. Wonderful. Uh, so Brian, please send it to me and I'm gonna post it on the meetup page for this meetup. So you can go ahead, everybody go, go ahead and read it. Um, all right, uh, so next time, Brian, we're going to be talking about a more complex topic. So tell me, tell me about it. Um, actually, I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I haven't decided, but you know, one thing I suggested uh, is this idea of renovationism. Mm -hmm. That's sort of a, a political historical idea about how Japan looks at itself in the modern world, how it got to be what it is, but it also relates to other um, national states. Uh, so th th that's that's one suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, if, uh, if oh, that 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 sounds great. That sounds great. So we can do that. I mean, uh, the, the the background for that is that I you know I you know I've I've always noticed that Japanese are able to change very fast as a culture. They go from being completely open to the world to completely close to the world and back to the or completely open to the world just like that. From being militaristic to pacifist to back to militaristic just like that. And so the, and comparatively places like India or the West move much slowly. So the question is why? And that's, that's kind of the, that's like the hook. That's the motivation to, to come and continue this conversation with Brian next Saturday at 12 o'clock. So Brian, thank you very much. This okay. was amazing. Okay. And thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.